Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. President Joe Biden wants to expand the role of government in your life with a post-pandemic safety net. What will his tax increases mean for both the real estate market and the economy? And how can you best navigate it? Author and frequent cable TV political commentator Kristen Tate joins me today to discuss this and more. But first, an update on what is happening with the direction of rents in the United States today on Get Rich Education. A lot of investors choose either cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market could provide both. Jacksonville, Florida, with 27% lower home prices than the national median and 1% higher rents, their market has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets over the last 30 years. Get positive cash flow today and appreciation for tomorrow. They often have available inventory in Jacksonville. Start at cashflowandgrowth.com. Hey, is your IRA in a real estate syndication? Yikes, a 37% UBIT tax could hit you, but you still have a chance to set up your EQRP and avoid this. Did you make too much money in 2020 and need more deductions? Now federal law lets you set up an EQRP in 2021 and get deductions for last year. Yeah, retroactively. Even put old IRA and 401k money in Bitcoin, gold, or your own business. Get control of all of your retirement money, tax and penalty free. Text EQRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE, from the mouth of the Columbia River in Astoria, Oregon, to the confluence of the Schuylkill and Delaware in Philadelphia, and across 188 nations worldwide, you're tuned into one of America's most listened to real estate investing shows. I'm Keith Weinhold. Kristen Tate will be with us shortly as we talk more politics than usual on the show today. Joe Biden is advancing his plan to give a $15,000 tax credit to first-time homebuyers. In my opinion, this is the wrong incentive, wrong policy. Now, as you know, I am not a partisan guy. I can't stand partisanship. It's polarizing. It divides America. I critique bad policy, not partisan affiliation. Okay, for example, I didn't like how Trump's tariffs stifled free marketeerism. The reason that the proposed $15,000 first-time homebuyer tax credit under Biden is the wrong policy is because it only helps the demand side. We don't need any more housing demand. In the last year plus, what has roughly happened is that housing demand has doubled while supply has been halved. Supply has been cut in even more than half, like I discussed last week. President Joseph R. Biden Jr., look, let me tell you, you know, you're a busy guy. I don't think you're listening to GRE every week, but this show has enough reach so that maybe a friend of a friend of yours listens and they'll share this with you. Joe, if you're going to help house Americans, we need help on the supply side, not the demand side. There's already tons of housing demand. So instead of this $15,000 first time homebuyer tax credit, what's needed is for you to help the supply side by doing something like ease building restrictions or lighten up on the regulatory hurdles for builders or make it easier for lumber suppliers to produce more wood for construction or even try to ease this Canadian U.S. softwood lumber dispute that's carried on for nearly four decades. If you're going to give tax incentives to anyone, well, then give them to developers and suppliers, but not home buyers. If you want to house more people, We need more housing supply, certainly not demand. That is the right policy, and that's why. And I've got to wonder if Biden is still being influenced from when he was Obama's vice president 12 years ago, because back in 2008, 2009, Obama extended a first-time homebuyer tax credit. Well, that made more sense back then because we were in the opposite condition that we are today. Back then, we had too much housing supply and not enough demand. So help the supply side today, Joe. House more Americans. That is going to help everyone. 
Now, let's talk about what Biden wants to do with capital gains taxes. First of all, in your own home, your primary residence, you already have a homeowner's exemption. If you've lived in your property for at least two of the last five years and you sell it for a profit, a gain, well, your first 250 k is completely exempt from capital gains tax if you're single and your first 500 k is not going to be taxed if you're married. Now, whether it's in the real estate world or the stock world, you only pay capital gains tax when you sell. One big change that Joe Biden wants to make does not apply to primary residences. So let's just talk about investment property. Now, one change that will hurt real estate investors is that he wants to limit the 1031 tax deferred exchange so that only your first 500K is eligible and therefore only that amount would potentially be exempt from capital gains tax. Well, if it goes through where Biden says that you can only get your first 500K of profit tax free, if it is indeed per deal, then what are investors going to do? I'll tell you what's going to happen in the real estate investment world. Investors are going to be more incentivized to do smaller deals and not big ones. Because look, how many investors will want to own, say, a $10 million apartment building then? You wouldn't want to because it's easy to get a 500K capital gain on those your building would only have to appreciate 5% in value for that to happen. So therefore, on big apartment deals, it's more likely that you'll have to pay a steep capital gains tax, currently 20% on the highest earners. And Biden also wants to raise that to 39.6%, plus potentially pay depreciation recapture too. Well, if it is per deal, and the first 500K can still get the tax deferral, then you'll have more money funneled into smaller properties like rental single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, and maybe up to about fourplexes as well. So that would create even more demand and therefore even more upward price pressure on one to four unit properties. If the 1031 is going away, or really it's currently proposed to be limited, like I just described, and say that this became effective on January 1st of next year. I'm just making up that date. Well, that would create a selling frenzy for investors that have substantial equity in larger properties already because those people would need to buy an exchange building and do their last exchange before this kicks in. So basically with the 1031 exchange, what you need to do is trade up for what's generally a more valuable building than the one that you're relinquishing. Now, in the short term, if this happened, that would be a near boom for real estate agents because there would be all this activity for people to sell their properties and trade up to larger buildings while the 1031 benefit is still fully in place. But see, long term, it does the opposite. It reduces liquidity because people will just hold on to their bigger buildings for decades because if they sold, they'd have a big capital gains tax bill now. So that's how you need to think about this potential 1031 exchange legislation and how you would need to get ready to position yourself. Chris and Tate and I will be sure to touch on this issue some more today. If you need to know the details of what it takes to prepare for a 1031 tax deferred exchange, it is a worthwhile benefit. It is great for real estate investors, but you've got to get the details right. I broke all of that down for you on GRE podcast episode number 143. I go deep into detail on that episode. Let's take a quick look at Zumper's national rent report. Andrea here at GRE supplied me with this. This is through the end of April. Now, in the more expensive markets, which really aren't the ones that we focus on here, New York, Boston, DC, San Francisco, rents have been growing now at about the same rate that they were in 2019 pre-pandemic. But between 2020 and now, rents were largely down. But with vaccinations, some people are moving back to the big cities. But yeah, big cities still have rents down on a year-over-year -year basis, like New York and Boston are both down a staggering 16%. I'm just rounding to the nearest whole percent here. Philly down 10%. DC down 4%. Again, these are year-over-year -year changes in rent price. And understand that in the real estate world, rent amounts are more stable than housing prices. So this is indeed unusual that we have rent price changes that are this 
dramatic. Yes, it is due to that aberration known as the pandemic. LA down 11%. San Francisco leading the nation in rent erosion down 25%. Now, smaller California cities have seen some rent price growth in Sacramento, Fresno, Bakersfield, and even Anaheim. When we zoom out and look at the national picture for a moment, Zumper tells us that in year-over-year terms, so that's April to April, that the one-bedroom median rent nationally is up 2.1%, while the two-bedroom median is up 3.4%. So nationally, you can see that rents are struggling to keep up proportionally with housing prices. And this often happens during times like now when housing prices run up, And then when housing prices flatten out later on, those rents tend to catch up later. So what this means is that now that housing prices have been appreciating rapidly, your rent-to-value ratio lowers, and then later when appreciation cools off, like it's got to eventually, your rent-to-value ratio tends to increase. Now, the fun part, let's zoom into some of the cash flow markets that we tend to focus on here, greturnkey.com markets on a year-over-year basis for rent growth. Just again, rounding the nearest whole percent here, looking at the Zumper National Rent Report, Memphis is up 12%, which is awesome news because so many of you invest there through midsouthhomebuyers.com, Atlanta up 3%, Richmond up 17%. That number is a little difficult to be believed. How much rents have increased April to April is what we're talking about here. And I've looked at Zumper's methodology, and it does include aggregating data from new construction. So if there would be a whole lump of new construction properties built in an MSA, that could skew the numbers. But, you know, Richmond's MSA is over a million people. So I don't know how Richmond rents could be up 17% year over year. We'll need to talk to our Richmond provider. If you happen to live in Richmond or know, write into us at info at getrichseducation.com. Richmond up 17% in rent year over year. That's a little hard to be believed. Baltimore up 8%. Dallas up 2%, but Arlington, Texas, which is more suburban and basically right between Dallas and Fort Worth, Arlington is up 11%. Oklahoma City down 1%. Colorado Springs up 6% in year-over-year rent amount, worth a mention because we just focused on that area last week. Boise up 15%. Salt Lake City up 5%. Phoenix up 5%. I'll tell you, why don't people invest our way like we do here at greturnkey.com? These investor advantaged markets, nearly everything is appreciating here from both a rent price growth perspective and a capital asset value. Cincinnati up 7%, Indy up 10%, St. Louis up 8%, Kansas City up 4%. Looking at Florida, Jacksonville up 8%, Tampa up 10%, St. Pete up 7%. Of course, those rent growth or rent contraction figures, they even vary within those MSAs. They're going to vary by neighborhood and by asset type and so on, but that just gives you some general idea of the recent rent price trajectory as we believe the pandemic begins to wane. So if you bought at greturnkey.com or you're currently under contract, you are in really good shape. If you just follow what I've been talking about doing for years here now, you are really in the driver's seat. The complete Zumper National Rent Report with an interactive map, that's all in the show notes for you at getricheducation.com slash 344, since this is episode 344. Though it's not today, coming up in the near future here on the show, probably next week, it's our ongoing series about how America is going to deal with today's housing supply crisis, and we're going to discuss the feasibility of building homes out of shipping containers in Florida. Last week, we discussed conventionally built homes there in Colorado. Even further down the road here on the show, we're going to discuss both the promise and the very real limits still of 3D printed homes. Kristen Tate is back on the show with us today. She's a popular commentator on both politics and taxes. And though I stay pretty nonpartisan on the show here, she certainly has her set of opinions. And whether you agree with them or not, her perspective is worth listening to. Optionally, if you would like to see the video of Kristen and I together, the entire interview with me is available today on our Get Rich Education YouTube channel. It's the same interview you're about to hear next. Kristen Tate and I on Biden tax increases and housing policies straight ahead. 
I'm Keith Weinhold. This is the show that's changed your financial future forever. And where financially free beats debt free, this is GRE. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans, and they finance single-family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You know, starting in real estate seems hard for some. Even experienced investors can find it difficult to achieve the success that they had hoped for. What if there was one small change everyone could make that would solve these challenges? Allie Boone offers a book that really no one else has. It's an easy to understand glimpse into the real estate investing industry and your mindset. It's life lessons on hacking your mind before you hack your wallet. Her book to grab on Amazon is called Not Your How-To Guide to Real Estate Investing. This is Keith Prosperity's Chris Martinson. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Today's guest is an author and writer focused on taxation and federal spending. She pens a weekly column for the Hill newspaper. She also appears frequently on cable news networks like Fox News and MSNBC. She last appeared with us here on GRE more than two years ago, rather to tell you that you pay more in taxes than for your housing, food, and clothing combined. If you can believe that, welcome back to GRE, Kristen Tate. Thank you so much for having me back, Keith. Kristen, so much has happened since you were last here. We've had a global pandemic. We've really gone from a time of economic prosperity since you were last here to a recession. And we've had the election of a new president, which includes him having some proposals for some pretty substantial tax increases. So tell us your thoughts. That's a lot. Overall, I think the last year has been quite depressing for fiscal conservatives like myself. I would be lying if I said that President Trump had a great record on spending. Of course, he did not. But Joe Biden has posed and enacted more spending bills in his first few months in office than Trump did during his entire presidency. For debt hawks, this is a very depressing time. I expect we'll see inflation on the horizon just because, of course, all of the spending is not being financed by tax dollars. It's being financed by debt, but also by money printing that's become out of control by the Federal Reserve. I'm not too optimistic about the future. I will say I think the next year will be pretty good. I think we'll see a big economic boom as we come out of these government lockdowns. We'll probably see consumer spending tick up pretty significantly just because people are going back to work and they're still getting uh, benefits from the government at the same time. And then, you know, on a two to five year sort of scale, I think that's when we'll really start to see more of the inflation kick in. And some of these other more harmful side effects of this tax and spend policy that we're seeing under the Biden administration. Many do expect a recovery now. Q1 GDP numbers came in at a 6.4% increase. So that certainly bodes well for the future. Yes, hopefully we will have a time of prosperity before we potentially hit a wall with inflation if that does indeed come down the road. You know, it's interesting with what Biden has proposed for taxes, and it has been quite substantial, quite revolutionary. It really goes along with all of the huge spending proposals that he's made in his first 100 days in office. We had most notably the $1.9 trillion COVID bill. A lot of people know that is the one attached to a $1,400 stimulus check. We had the $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan still being negotiated on Capitol Hill. Now we've got the $1.8 $1.8 trillion American Families Plan, which Biden laid out in his joint session to Congress. That's the one that includes paid leave, universal preschool, and tuition-free college for all. Well, someone needs to end up paying for that. Kristen, I'm just letting this word trillion roll off my tongue like mm-hmm. it's just another word, but this is substantial spending. You mentioned how the prior administration, Trump, did a lot of spending too. It seems like every president pretty much doubles the national debt. We're at $28 trillion now. So what are your thoughts with all the spending that is attached to these tax proposals from Biden? 
I would actually argue that the tax proposals are not necessarily related to the spending because the tax proposals that he has laid out would not even come close to covering the spending that he's proposing. Even if you confiscated the wealth, the entire wealth of every billionaire in this country, you would not come close to financing these plans that he's laid out. So that's what's so disturbing here. Of course, I don't like tax hikes, but at least that's a form of paying for spending where you don't have to rely on money printing and debt. That's simply not what's happening here. What's happening here is we are entering this new kind of government. We're leaving neoliberalism behind and we're entering this new way of managing the economy that's never been tried in this country before, by which we just print trillions of dollars every month and expect there to be no consequences. It's called modern monetary theory, and it's a monetary theory that's been adopted by a lot of these young progressives like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, millennials, Gen Zers, these kids who didn't live through or remember bad economic times after 9-11 and then during the 2008 recession. I don't think you can keep spending like this without financing it through taxes and not have inflation happen. Eventually, the entire house of cards collapses, and every dollar that the Fed prints makes us all poorer. So I think a lot of people are going to be flocking to real estate. You know, some people say, oh, we're in a bubble right now with real estate prices. I'm not so sure about that. I think real estate could keep going up as people look for ways to get out of the U.S. dollar. Of course, cryptocurrency has been on the rise for the past year. Bitcoin and, and Ethereum have done phenomenally well. People will find ways to get out of the dollar as it drops in value, as they keep printing this money. Now, as for the taxes, even though those can't come close to financing these plans, they are very punitive, not only to high earners, but to middle income earners too. For example, he plans to raise income tax at first, he said on anyone making over 400 grand a year. Now we know it's actually 200 grand because a married couple, if each one makes 200, they're actually doing it by household. If you have a couple, each one's making $200,000 and they live in New York City or San Francisco, they're doing okay, but they're certainly not rich. And then the tax hikes, by the way, they're not indexed for inflation. So as wages go up due to inflation, you could have more people in the middle class hit by these tax hikes. Secondly, he's taxing capital gains at a higher rate for high earners and, and people with a lot of wealth. That will also hurt the middle class by incentivizing people to pull their money out of the stock market. It's going to make 401ks, retirement plans, and pension plans potentially take a big hit. These tax hikes, they are portrayed as only affecting the extremely wealthy, but they could have devastating impacts on the middle class. And what's really terrifying about it is even with all the revenue that'll be coming in, it won't come anywhere close to financing this big spending blowout that's about to occur. I think you bring up some good points. Even if the proposed tax hikes go through, they're not commensurate with the level of spending that's going on, and they're not going to fund it. Politicians often give these populist platitudes. Sometimes it don't mean very much. I've heard Biden say that Americans, especially the wealthy, just need to pay their fair share. That's such a popular thing to say, but what is fair? That's up to everyone's judgment. Another thing that Biden has said with his proposed tax increases, and this goes along with the populist platitudes, is I'm here to tax wealth, not work. I think you're giving us a little bit more context in that these don't just affect the wealthy. They can affect everyday people. One thing that would hit the wealthy some more before we talk about the capital gains tax changes he'll potentially make is with the top income tax rate. Trump brought that down from 39.6 to 37 percent. Biden proposes, at least on the highest earners, to bring that back up to 39.6 percent. And then, of course, you have the Affordable Care Act surcharge there, which now makes the federal rate for the top earners 43.4 percent. And of course, we're only talking about the federal. We're not even talking mm -hmm. about the state income taxes that they might have as well. So is that really the right course to take? Because America is based on capitalism and people taking opportunistic risks and hiring people and using innovation to build businesses and so on. But more than half those people's dollar could be taxed. Well, I guess, Kristen, at, at what point does the tax rate become so high that people aren't even incentivized to work when we talk about some of these higher income tax rates? I think it's already getting to that point. We're incentivizing the extremely wealthy to simply move their dollars to other countries, to invest in other countries. 
you could also talk about the corporate tax rate, which is doing the same thing. Innovation is going to be spurred, not in the U.S. necessarily, but in more favorable tax environments. This idea of the government being the ultimate good that we've seen embraced increasingly on the left. There's no problem that the left thinks it can't solve with another tax hike. And by giving more power to the state, the end result of all of this, of the tax hikes, of the spending, the result of all of it is the growing of the size and scope of the federal government, giving the federal government more control over the private sector, over families' incomes, over how people spend their money. These people in Washington, D.C., they think that they know how to spend your money better than you do. People with these high tax rates will have less money to spend, which means less money going into the economy, which means businesses are going to take a hit, which means fewer job opportunities will be available. And it all comes back to the government, more people on welfare, more people getting these handouts from these programs that are being created by the Biden administration. It is the antithesis of what this country was founded on. It's the antithesis of the American spirit of individualism and free marketeerism. It's just very bleak and it's actually patronizing to hardworking people. I guess this is very depressing. I'm coming off as a big pessimist right now, but to someone like me, to the people who, who are concerned about this level of spending and government dependency, it seems like we're about to enter a very dark time that's unprecedented in modern American history in terms of just the size of the U.S. government and the influence it has over people's lives and the private sector. Of course, the income tax is that type of tax that's more likely to hit everyday working people people that work for what we would call active income. Mm -hmm. When it comes to taxes on passive income, we're looking at capital gains tax changes. I think proponents of the capital gains tax hike that Biden has proposed on high earners, which would basically just about double their capital gains tax rate and step it up to that highest income tax rate of 39.6%. One can take both sides of this. Proponents of a capital gains tax hike They say, now, why should, quote unquote, wealthy investors be taxed at a lower rate than those everyday job workers? I mean, this is that whole thing with the Warren Buffett effect, where Warren Buffett says at Berkshire Hathaway, he is the least taxed person in his entire office because his income coming from investments and workers don't. So really, that's the proponent of what the capital gains tax hike people have to say. Right. And I hear that argument. I do. But again, the capital gains tax hike will have detrimental impacts to middle income people, especially, by the way, people on fixed incomes and older folks who are on their pension plans. Because when you punish big players in the market and you incentivize them to pull their capital out and put it into something else, that really does have a a very devastating impact on pension plans, 401ks, retirement plans. The market exists to help everyone at every level of the economy, especially, again, people who are on fixed incomes. A lot of this stems from talking points on the left, particularly about going after the rich, soaking the rich. And a lot of these kids, college kids and, you know, the followers of modern monetary theory, they hear these talking points and they think it sounds great because they don't really know how the market works. People who rely on the strength of the market overall can get hurt by these kinds of tax hikes. And by the way, when you take away capital from the highest earners, when you take away capital from the most wealthy, you give them less to build with, right? So they have less capital to invest in business growth or in a new venture or they have less money to buy things with. And when you buy things, you're spurring economic growth. We've seen these kinds of taxes fail in the past, by the way. I mean, past uh, attempts at a luxury tax just failed miserably and had detrimental impacts. When we put in place a luxury tax in the 20th century, what happened is the only people who got hurt weren't actually the rich. It was people who built yachts, construction workers, construction companies got really hurt by that. And other blue collar workers who rely on these industries that create products for people who have the money to spend. So, you know, it's a nuanced, complicated issue. And again, I keep going back to the fact that the revenue we'd gain from these taxes would not even come close to spending or to funding the spending that's being proposed by this administration, which means it's more just a punitive tax. It it punishes people. It takes money out of the market and it doesn't even get the job done when it comes to spending on these big programs. 
Now, when it comes to Biden proposed capital gains tax heights, what I just did is I gave the proponent side of hiking the taxes. And when Biden talks about effectively hiking the capital gains tax rate from 20% on the highest earners to 39.6%, now I'll take the other side of it. Detractors to that hike say that, hey, inflation makes paying the capital gains tax a total ripoff. Because look, if I have a $100,000 property, or a $100,000 stock, and over a number of years, it appreciates to 200 k well, that might not even be any real growth. That might just be reflected in the diminished purchasing power of the dollar for that value to go from 100 k to 200 k So why am I being taxed on that? I didn't have any real gain. So that's why detractors yep. of the capital gains tax hike say, hey, that's not right. It's right to keep capital gains taxes lower because taxation is not adjusted for inflation. That's exactly right. And by the way, none of his tax hikes are adjusted for inflation. That includes the income tax. That includes the corporate tax hike, all of them. So it's just another way that this policy is really ill-advised. But what's so frustrating about it is I don't think any of these arguments are even making their way to the Oval Office. This is all about optics. This is all about pleasing a base of voters who has this vendetta against wealth creation, the private sector. They want redistribution on a large level because they've been brainwashed in these colleges to believe that, you know, rich people are evil. And it's just so backwards. And it's the opposite of everything this country stands for. You know, we're supposed to tell people coming up in the world, coming up in the country, hey, if you work hard, you can be one of those rich people. You can build a, a corporation. You can start your own business. You could start your own podcast. The possibilities are endless. Instead, what these kids are learning is, no, you deserve something for nothing. And we're going to take money from these other people and give it to you. It's just so detrimental. But this idea and this mindset is spreading like wildfire around this country. And ultimately, that mindset has captured the Democratic Party. We see it with the most powerful people in the party today. And those people, they're sucking up all the oxygen in the room when it comes to the Democratic Party and controlling a lot of the policy that we're seeing coming out of an administration that promised it would be extremely moderate. It's been nothing but. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. And I think what's most concerning to real estate investors when it comes to capital gains tax is this Biden proposal or perhaps just a wish to reduce the 1031 tax deferred exchange. Prior administrations have stated this wish previously. In fact, the Trump administration is the one that blew up a lot of portions of the 1031 tax deferred exchange for things like farm equipment and so on. But Trump was that real estate investor president. So therefore, that privilege has existed for real estate investors, where basically a real estate investor can relinquish one property. And as long as they move the equity into a suitable replacement property within a few months, they don't pay any capital gains tax on it. But this is what incentivizes entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to take risk and provide housing for people and provide jobs for people. Right. You'd say the same for all of these tax hikes. All of these policies do not incentivize growth or risk taking at all. They incentivize precisely the opposite. And what people need to understand, especially young people and employees who think that they're not going to get hurt by any of this stuff, is it always will trickle down and hurt the most vulnerable. It's always the most vulnerable who get hurt by these kinds of tax hikes. Because you know what? The business owners and the people doing really well, they'll get hurt by them, but they'll survive. They'll, they'll be okay. It's the people who are on fixed incomes and low incomes or who maybe can't find a job right now who always get hurt hardest by these economic policies that disincentivize growth, disincentivize job creation. And it's really a shame. And then the federal government swoops in and gets people dependent on checks. Unfortunately, that seems to be <laughs> a feature, not a bug of some of the policy that seems to be coming out of the White House right now. Who in the heck would go to work if you have stepped up unemployment exactly. compensation and a stimulus check coming in every few months? In a way, you can't blame the people. Why show oh, up to I, work? I don't blame the people at all. I have uh, some small business owners in my family. Uh, for example, my stepmother owns some small restaurants in Boston. She can't get some of her employees to come back to work because they make more now not working. Like you said, you can't blame them. People act in their best interest. But what are we going to do if we have a significant portion of our population that won't go back to work? I mean, that's a huge problem for our economy. We've got to stop with these stimulus payments and the handouts. 
especially because the economy is roaring back. I mean, you really do want to stimulate the economy during an actual recession. The problem is we had an artificial recession. We were in a recession because of government imposed lockdowns. The lockdowns are mostly being lifted now. COVID under control. Everyone has the vaccine at this point and needs it. If you want to get it, you can get it in most states at this point. So the economy really doesn't need stimulus right now. What we need are tax cuts. What we need is the government getting out of the way and letting people spend their money and go back to work. And with all the spending there, like we talked about earlier, that does introduce some inflationary pressures to your earlier point. Of course, the quantitative easing cycles coming out of the global financial crisis never really gave us the inflation a lot of people thought we'd have. We now have a CPI that's somewhat stepped up to 2.6%, and we can go on and on all day about how that's a a phony number and doesn't even include things like asset prices and food and energy and those sorts of things. But why don't you talk to us more about this possibility for inflation and then just what we can do to take action, whether that's buying real assets, which retain their purchasing power over time, or something like Bitcoin, which the last time you were here, Chris, and Bitcoin was something that was just laughed off. But now big institutional investors are in it. A lot of institutional clients are saying to their money manager, hey, I feel left out if you're not participating in something like cryptocurrency. So tell us about some strategies that we can do to hedge ourselves against inflation if you think that's coming. I would argue inflation's already happening. For example, a two by three stick of lumber that cost $2 a couple of years ago, that same stick of lumber today costs about $8. We've seen prices for groceries go up in the past year, prices for gas. Now, I know a lot of that is related to supply chain issues that we saw with COVID, but the supply chains are back up and running now, and we're still seeing price increases that are fairly significant. Big scale inflation is coming about two to five years down the road because you can't keep spending trillions of dollars of printed money every month with absolutely no consequences. So I prefer investing in physical assets like silver and gold. People should diversify into other things too. I mean, I own some cryptocurrencies. I consider crypto to be a more risky investment. It's much more speculative. I'm very bullish on Bitcoin and Ethereum over the next year. I'm not so bullish over the next three to five year period, simply because I think the federal government is going to do everything it can to destroy Bitcoin. The Fed will want full control over the way people interact with our economy. They want full control over our monetary system. And if they think Bitcoin becomes a real threat to our monetary system, I think they will do everything they can to squash it. And even when the first whispers of whatever that action is make public news, Bitcoin's going to drop like a rock. For now, I'm in Bitcoin. I'm in Ethereum. I'm even in Dogecoin a little bit, which has done really well. I plan to at some point, pull my assets completely out of crypto because I don't want to be holding the bag when the the whole thing goes down the tubes. Of course, real estate is probably the best hedge against inflation, which you know better than I do. My father is a landlord. He's been scooping up as many properties as he can. Everyone just needs to find ways to get out of the US dollar if they're concerned about inflation. Just find as many ways as you can to diversify And I happen to think that inflation's a real threat. So those are some steps that I'm taking. I don't think Chris is telling everyone to move it all into Dogecoin, a coin based on a dog meme. (laughs) Although I will say, I've made more money on Dogecoin than any other investment in the last year. I put some money into it when it was worth about, you know, a cent. I think it was actually a little less than a cent and we're up to like 30 cents now. 30x? Yeah, it was a pretty fun ride on Dogecoin. Every time Elon Musk tweets about it, it's like I log in to see what the value's at. It's really fun. That's right. Yep. It's a little bit gamified, Kristen. So, well, hey, this has been great. You really give us a lot to think about with what's happening in the economy, what to expect with Biden tax policies, how to respond to inflation if you think that's going to happen. Kristen, if our audience wants to connect with you and get into your world and learn more about you, whether that's your excellent books or anything else, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure thing. So my Twitter is Kristen B. Tate, and that's spelled K-R-I-S-T-I-N B. Tate. I mostly tweet about economics through a political lens. So I'm certainly not as as learned as you are when it comes to real estate, but I have a lot to say about politics frequently on Fox News. You can find me there debating whatever the hot political topic of the day is. And my most recent book came out last year. It's called The Liberal Invasion of Red State America, 
where I traced domestic migration trends of people moving from coastal blue states to the Sun Belt and the political consequences of that. So you can find that book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, but the main way to interact with me is on Twitter, which is Kristen B. Kate. That's my handle there. Kristen Tate, it's been great catching up and chatting again. Thanks so much for coming out of the show. Thank you so much for having me, Keith. Oh, yeah, it's good to hear from Kristen again. You can watch the entire uncut video from our chat that you just heard today on our Get Rich Education YouTube channel. We don't have all of the podcast interviews there on video, but this one is Yeah, with the nature of this recession, a health crisis, some people have lost their lives, so we want to keep investment losses in perspective. But I lost out a little bit when a couple tenants lost their jobs last year and couldn't pay the rent. I also have a Panama coffee farm investment, I know that some of you do too, where the supply chain was disrupted such that there was trouble selling and shipping the coffee. Back to Kristen and I's chat, one theme here is that government intervention in the free market economy often has bad downstream consequences, even though everything appears rosy on the surface. Another example, really, that goes along with that is that rent control, that's something that sounds nice on the surface. That's where there is a cap, a ceiling imposed on the rent amount that a tenant can be charged. Well, what happens is within years or decades, Entire properties and complete neighborhoods become ill-maintained, dilapidated, and crime-ridden. And why does that happen? Because landlords have zero incentive to improve properties if they can't charge more in rent. Another interest of Kristen's, and we share this interest, is diversifying outside of the U.S. dollar, doing that with real estate, gold, silver, and cryptocurrency. I've got to share more with Kristen later and tell her more about GREturnkey.com, where I buy my own property in the best U.S. markets and how real estate investors win the inflation triple crown. Gold and silver are actually good value buys now, historically speaking, because they are some of the few assets of enduring value that have not run up in price here in recent years. I dedicated about half of an episode here to telling you how Bitcoin works a few months ago in an episode named Real Estate versus Bitcoin. If you want to refresh your learning there, it is episode 322. Bitcoin is a decentralized global digital currency. And what makes it compelling and limits Bitcoin's inflation rate is the fact that there is a predictable and finite supply. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. That is written into the code. Almost 19 million have been mined now, and the mining rate is such that only 900 new Bitcoins a day come into existence, and that mining rate keeps halving over time so that the last Bitcoin will be mined in the year 2140. Though it's called a cryptocurrency, it really still isn't accepted as currency in that many places. That's probably why crypto asset is a more appropriate moniker at this stage in its life cycle. Some people say that you can't shut Bitcoin down. Others say, yeah, you can't shut it down, but you can still outlaw ownership of it, much like what was done with gold last century. But see, whenever those shutdown threats alone surface, that can get people scared and make them want to sell off. And we've seen evidence of that already. Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's right-hand man at Berkshire Hathaway, Munger recently said at their annual shareholder meeting just over a week ago about Bitcoin that it's disgusting and contrary to the interests of civilization. Some incredibly scathing comments there. And right after that, Munger said, and I'll leave the criticism to others (laughs) a little late. When it comes to inflation at the latest Fed meeting a couple weeks ago, the Fed's plan to keep their easy money policy in place. That means keeping interest rates near zero and continuing to create that $120 billion per month. They said at their policy symposium last year that they're not concerned if inflation runs above 2% and they really seem to be doubling down on that premise. We are seeing more anecdotal evidence of inflation. You're seeing it in your food prices. You're seeing it in your gasoline prices and, of course, asset prices of all types. And then there are the supply chain issues that create scarcity, limiting supply for building materials in real estate like drywall and copper 
and lumber, creating price inflation there. Check out Kristen's books. She's a prolific writer at kristenbtate.com. Note that she has two eyes in her first name. Her latest book that she described there is more salient to real estate investors as well because it describes recent American migration patterns. Follow her on Twitter. Her handle there is at Kristen B. Tate. Maybe you identify with her brand of politics. Maybe you don't, and maybe you're indifferent. But you know, in today's politically polarized world, some best practices to get a variety of opinions on issues affecting the world are to avoid clicking on the suggested videos in your feed and to follow people that you don't necessarily agree with. It keeps people from becoming divided into these intellectual and philosophical silos. So then follow Kristen on Twitter. I dare you. Again, it's at Kristen B. Tate. Big thanks to Kristen today. More real estate on the show next week. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Until then, don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.